everybody. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit before we get to the PowerPoint because I just wanted to kind of capture in advance what it is I'm trying to communicate as we go through the slides uh, that show you what uh, our design is and, and it will start at the construction next spring. But the challenge of getting to the design you're going to see is one that lots of people are familiar with, but I think it, um, it really came to play in the Commonwealth the Avenue Park, right? and that's the balancing of all the modes when you're trying to renovate an existing roadway. It certainly had all the modes between transit, uh, bicycling, pedestrians, uh, vehicular traffic. It's a national highway system roadway, so big trucks, big buses. Um, and our initial key focus was on safety, <coughs> addition of left turn lanes, looking out for pedestrians and bicyclists and motorists, and all of the issues that pertain to safety. Um, but we knew going into it that something would have to give because we couldn't do everything for everybody. Um, and, and as we got into the design, we had to deal with the realities of what's the difference between the road we, we plan to now build and <coughs> typical maintenance as one, one topic. Um, what will the things we do for one mode mean for others? And the things that wound up giving a little bit were the sidewalk space, the lane widths and parking. And, and we did that because we, after thorough evaluation, came to the conclusion that that was the best balance to come to. Um, so the evolution of the design is another interesting point. We started about four years ago with this design. And on the one hand, many times along the road, we wish we could be under construction, but I think it, was, it turned into a blessing that we had a lot more time to deal with the feedback that came in. Um, and even as the city's standards were evolving in terms of what we would like to do for various modes, especially uh, the bicycle mode, I think that delay that came from a combination of working out uh, specific dimensions that were needed for the T's reservation um, and looking, at, looking into a number of other issues that required a lot of, uh, a lot of review it gave us the time to, I think, get to, to a very good balance. So, as we tried to design a project, one segment of Commonwealth Avenue, we, we looked at what was next to it, and that creates certain constraints. Uh, we had phase one approaching it from one side, um, and we have uh, yet to be built phase three and four to the other side, so we had to make what we were doing work with the adjacent projects. And along comes another project that is going to rebuild the deck at the intersection of Com Ave and the B uh, over the Mass Turnpike, right next to our project on, the, on one side. Um, but we also had all the realities. You're going to see something when I get into the slides about what happens under the street. All of, all of those utilities created a, a lot of study, a lot of extra time, a lot of extra engineering effort that had to go into it. And you'll see it reflected in what happens with uh, things like the bike track and how we had to make adjustments into how the bike track would work in one instance in a half a block away we had to change the approach to make it work there because we had to respect <coughs> the complications and the expense of doing too many changes that would affect a wholesale rebuilding of a drainage system for instance. Um, and the other message I'd like to get across is that this project wouldn't be what it is without a tremendous amount of support directly within City Hall and the various departments that supported it in BTD, the mayor himself, and his uh, instincts that this needed to be a cutting edge project. Uh, I think that was a reflection of his general intentions and also uh, a compliment to the folks that took us out on a bicycle ride that happened to coincidentally end on Commonwealth Avenue. So with that, I'll get into the slide presentation. Okay, so that introduction <clears throat> gets us to the final design and, and ultimately we'll get into what were the requirements to be successful in this project. Uh, so, so here's the, the, the beginning and end of the project. It, it starts just west of the Bayou Bridge and you can see that white pavement 
right over here, you can see that's the adjacent project to come out deck over the mass turnpike that's going to be built right next to us. So our project runs from this point to just shy of Packard's Corner. Um, amidst that, I mentioned the T improvements. The MBTA has four stations there. You'll hear, hear from Kurt the key is more about that. Uh, but the key point is that we had to figure out what was going to happen to the T reservation. And as they take their four stations and reduce it to two, we also had to be respectful no matter where the stations were, what are the minimum standards today for a T reservation. And for people who may have lost space on the sidewalks as a result of the widening of the T reservation, I'd like to point out the fact that pedestrians stand on the platforms as well. So it's a, it's a combination of sidewalks and T platforms that make up the pedestrian space. So here's a good look at a typical section. Uh, looking east, we've got uh, some roadway widths that used to be 11 or even 11 and a half at different points in our design. And you can see that the through lanes are now 10 and a half feet. We have uh, turn lanes we'll show you in a minute. Uh, there's parking in some places, in some other places parking had to go away. There wasn't enough room for it. And the sidewalks that are out there today who, that handle enormous numbers of pedestrians because of the presence of Boston University's student bodies are in fact going through a bit of a reduction, but we were very careful to make sure that we didn't reduce them uh, beyond what would work for those pedestrians. Oh, sorry. Um, so, here you see the bicycle track, and typically the bicycle track is going to be separated from the parked cars by a three foot raised buffer. So, suddenly we're putting in three times as many linear feet of curbing. Um, we're creating a safe environment that's six and a half feet wide typically for the bicyclists. It's a one-way uh, direction on, on each side of the roadway. Uh, we were introducing a lot more uh, greenery as we did on phase one. Uh, when we left off with phase one and when we started the design of this project, we were at a point in the evolution of our thinking that, um, and this is four years ago, that phase one should largely be continued. Uh, phase one had a, a bike lane, and we would put in a bike lane there, and we uh, expanded our thinking to say it might be a buffered bike lane to prevent door swings and whatnot. But in that evolution, again, of those four years, we came a long way to get to a, a position where the bikes are here and not out here next to moving vehicles and parked cars. And here, here is a typical section with a turning lane. Our, our turning lanes are down to 10 feet because every foot counted. Uh, the MBTA reservation from center line of track needed to be this uh, 12 foot and three quarters to provide sufficient space for platforms and, and other safety issues that the T requires around their vehicles and in their track. Um, here's a typical block. Some of the highlights in the typical block are, I'll just kind of show you the path of the bicycle. The bicycle's coming up to the corner here. I'm going to show you an intersection in a little more detail in just a minute. Uh, continues through the end of this intersection. And the end is out here and back here. And we're going to look at uh, this intersection in just a minute in a little more detail. And similarly on the opposite side. Um, in some cases, we have parking. We have uh, another big issue that you're going to see more detail on is how do we deal with bus stops? We talked a little bit about the trolleys, but we also have the very real fact that there's lots of buses that the university runs, the shuttle buses and the MBTA buses that need to be accommodated in an environment where the bicycles are up here in what traditionally had been purely a, a pedestrian zone. So here's a closer look at an intersection and between uh, Beta and Tool Design Group, uh, we, we sat and thought real hard about 
what should happen at the intersections and with a lot of the good feedback and suggestions we were receiving from the community, we eventually settled on one of these protected intersection arrangements where instead of a bike, the, the big difference is now instead of a bicycle being here in a big ugly truck going to make a turn being right next to it and there being a lot of confusion on the part of the uh, bicyclist or the motorist are just simply uh, a lack of awareness that turning vehicle poses a, a huge hazard for the bicyclist. By having the bicyclist over here, the vehicle actually starts to turn and can be looking out its front windshield, uh, the, the driver, and actually see a, a, a bicyclist crossing through here. Um, and likewise, the bicyclist has plenty of additional time uh, in, in terms of what it used to be to see a vehicle turning towards their path. So it creates more safety for both. This is the point I raised at the beginning of how can we do these buffers in every case and what would we do to compromise uh, from the traditional approach, or, or the standard approach, uh, which, where is this? Okay, so our standard approach of having a raised curb down to the cycle track, a raised curb for the buffer, another curb, Instead of doing that in every case, in some cases, due to drainage issues, uh, okay. we would do this instead. We'd have a curb here, a bike track, another curb that goes down instead of up, um, and the buffer being at the same level as the bicycle track. These are limited cases, but they're for those who will come out here and help us cut the ribbon, uh, you won't see 100% this type of arrangement when it's built. And then the last course, and you're going to see this when we get into uh, bike, uh, I'm sorry, the bus stops in particular, you're going to see that there is no curb down and curb up uh, for the bike track because it's now in some cases running behind where people are loading onto buses and it would create a hazard of its own to, to be of this nature when people are walking across to get into uh, a bus and other situations where the underground utilities created a conflict. So here, here's the case of the bus station or the bus stop. Uh, we have protection here because as people are crossing from the main sidewalk area to over this raised area, um, it's coming up from a typical cycle track, six and a half feet down here, it comes up, we need all of the ADA protections to get people into the waiting area for the buses, and we don't want them meandering in random fashion into the way of uh, moving bicycles out of just simply uh, standing, talking to a friend, and kind of wind up in a collision. So, so we had uh, a painstaking process, which got us to a very good end of creating a barrier so that folks don't have to uh, expect pedestrians to be crossing any which way, but simply at this location. Transit signal priority is already underway. We're working with MassDOT and MBTA, and we're uh, introducing, we even have the Route 57 bus, which is going down Commonwealth Avenue. We have one of our individual intersections. We've already set it up so that we can add intersections pretty swiftly. You're almost out of time. Okay. All right, I'm going to move along. We'll talk about ITS later. Um, and here's some pictures of the streetscape that we're taking from phase one. Uh, requirements for success, looking at alternatives, collaboration with stakeholders. I think that's one of the hugest ones there. We, those two uh, top off the list. And some of the alternatives that we did look at, we were looking at the buffered bike lanes, we looked at a median bike track, uh, we, we looked at the entire bike track being at sidewalk height, and let's see, this is one of the most important, if not the most important slide that I want to share with folks. Uh, mass bike. Lots of action inside City Hall. The mayor, his office, the police department, the public works, water and sewer, BRA, all contributed to this. Um, but we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for MassDOT and their teams 
Uh, Al Miller was heroic in, in helping us get this project ready and advertised. Federal Highway um, saw the light on um, a number of our suggestions when we were trying to squeeze things in. We needed variances. They understood and, and were there with us. The MBTA was a partner throughout all of this. Uh, I, I mentioned the governor's office in particular because we had to get special legislation signed on this project. And um, I see uh, Brian Valancourt out there from AECOM, whose team led us to get right of way in both the city of Boston and the town of Brookline. And because this, this roadway had that unique characteristics, uh, a tip of the hat to AECOM and, and Brian for all of their hard work. Um, the state legislature had to get us through this Boston MPO, making the funds available and believing in the project. The Boston University, the main uh, butter to this project and with lots of great input and lots of uh, significant criticisms. Uh, Livable Streets, Boston Cyclist Union, they, they came to the table and were patient with us and, and took us out for bike rides and, and, and really got their thinking across to us in a very successful manner. The town of Brookline supported the project, supported us taking right-of-way easements in, in uh, construction easements in their town, and the utility companies who all cooperated enormously to help us resolve a lot of issues related to the conflicts or potential conflicts. So I think you've heard enough about balancing all the various needs. I'm going to yield to the other speakers here, and I think I've covered the main points. Thank you.